good evening once again and welcome to Dr. On Call. It is Tuesday, of course, and uh, every Tuesday at this time we bring you your favorite program. Uh, this evening we have a very special program for you. In fact, um, uh, we were supposed to do this last week, but um, of course the 2024 Intercall Games robbed us of that opportunity. But um, it was all good, um, so we're back this week, and um, we will be sharing with you a lot of wonderful information, which is, we think is uh, quite relevant and quite pertinent for us. We're looking at uh, an evaluation of dietary intakes and food preparation methods pre- and post-pandemic among Grenadian households. And of course, uh, Caracou and Petit Martinique included. So, we welcome all our viewers on GBN Television, 7 and 11, uh, listeners in K105 FM, and of course, our friends on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. We welcome you. And of course, a little later on in the program, we will open our telephone lines because we would also want to hear from you. You may have questions that you would like to ask our guests, and so we We'll be happy to afford you that opportunity. This evening, um, we have with us uh, Dr. Claudette Mitchell, Dr. Keisha Law, and uh, Mrs. Lydia Brown, of course, no stranger to our program. And it's a good time to welcome them. Um, I think I'm honored this evening. I'm in the company of three ladies and um only recently we celebrated international women's day so um in fact every day should be women's day uh, they play such an important role in the lives of every single one of us so let's start with um our regular mrs brown mrs lydia brown good evening and welcome again to doctor and call Good evening, and it's happy. I'm happy to be here again, especially for this occasion. Yes, indeed. Dr. Law, you're no stranger either, so welcome back. Thank you, Bob. It's been quite a while, but I'm glad to be back. Yes, yes, indeed. And of course, I don't recall having Dr. Mitchell, but I'm quite happy because it means that she will be back. Dr. Mitchell, good evening, and welcome to Doctor and Call. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Okay, wonderful. So this evening, folks, as I said, we're looking at a very important issue. Um, it's uh, a research uh, that um, was done or is being done, and of course, that we will learn about a little later on. So um, I want every one of you to pay very close attention because I said it's very, very important. And so I'm going to start with Mrs. Brown. Mrs. Brown, um, an evaluation of data intakes and food preparation methods pre and post pandemic among um, Grenadian household. Um, let's put that into perspective, and then we will bring in Dr. Lowe and Dr. Mitchell. So this, uh, this study is actually has not yet started. Okay. So it's something that we're embarking on, and hopefully by doing programs such as this, we will sensitize the Grenadian populace as to what is coming, so that when we come out, you know, our forces that they will be accepting of us coming out and to take a look at what Grenadians are actually consuming. We know that um, just pre and post pandemic, we hear people speak and we, we anticipate that people may have made changes um, because of the pandemic and because of the insult that it had on our people. Of course, we had less of an insult than some of the larger countries. But um, but we know that there was some of us lost loved ones. We lost longer people. We lost older people. And so we people would have become a little more aware of the need to maintain a healthy lifestyle. And this is what we that is what we think we know. But we don't want to think. We want the Grenadian people to be able to tell us what is actually happening. And from that, we are able to move forward and know what needs to be done and, and what changes has to be made, what policies may need to be put in place and such. 
Okay, wonderful indeed. Um, so, Dr. Mitchell, we'll come to you next. Um, this study, um, it is important, but um, let's go into some details as to why we think it's necessary to have such a study done. Okay, first of all, good evening, listeners, and thank you for your question. It is important because during the pandemic, Latin America and the Caribbean, the research shows that 59.7 million people within the same region experience food insecurity. Yes, there may be multiple factors for that, such as the multiple lockdowns, etc. But what they also noted is that food insecurity increased during households. When we talk about food security, um, we are looking at in in place, what we are referring to is food that is safe, accessible, nutritious, and available to all people. So this study hoped to accomplish what is what is actually happening within Grenadian households, what happened pre-pandemic. We know we are up against some recall bias. There are some people may remember, but when we come to post-pandemic, that information is very valuable. And I would like to underscore what Mrs. Brown mentioned, the research evidence is critical so that um, the, the information provided can help to revise food and nutrition existing programs, as well as help to formulate policy. So we are looking at research evidence, knowledge utilization, which would come from that study, what the Grenadian households, the information they would provide. And we are also looking at knowledge uptake, whereby we are thinking in terms of how do we now disseminate? How do we get the key messages out there so that the population can continue to maintain their health or improvement can be made as it re relates to policy? Okay, thank you very much. Very important, very important, because um, what we consume can determine um, almost everything about our lives, um, how long we live and, and all of that. Um, you mentioned food security, and, and Dr. Lou, I'm going to come to you now, because food security is very important. It is, um, it's been spoken about everywhere. Um, but one of the very important factors has to do um, not just um, with uh, safe foods or the availability of foods, but also um, whether or not people can afford the safe and available foods um, which will work in their best interest. After this study is done, the information that we get from households, how would that help to change the whole issue of affordability? Because, um, you know, that falls a little outside of the, the, the safety and availability. Yes, you can have safe foods and foods can be available, but can people afford it? Um, how will the study work along those lines? Well, Garfi, good night, everyone. Um, one of the things that we have been looking at also is the kind of food people are choosing. And in terms of um, what's been foods that are not nutritionally rich and dense. And so I think this kind of study will give us the data to see, well, really what are we consuming in our households? How often are you shopping pre and post pandemic? What type of foods? How often are you eating your staples and your local foods, which is definitely going to be much healthier than the processed foods that we have been trending towards. And of course, you know me, I'm going to get on my bandwagon about the increase in non communicable diseases that we've been experiencing in Grenada, the hypertension, the diabetes, all these things are definitely affected by what we eat. Our food is really our medicine. And I think that this study is going to be a landmark study and it's going to help us to see the facts, not just we, you know, guessing what's happening. We're actually going to be getting hard data and being able to, you know, 
change policies and try to start from the ground up in terms of the food and nutrition. Dr. Law, let me just let me just education. let me just stop you for a moment. Your audio seemed to be very low. Can you adjust? I think it may be the volume on your your uh, pieces. Oh, okay. So if you can adjust that, um, increase the volume there, um, that should be able to help. Can you hear me better now? Yes, I'm hearing you a little better. Mm -hmm. Should I, t I can take off the speaker if you think it might be the earphone. Well, if we can hear you better without it, great. Um, Is it better now? Can you hear me better oh, now? Perfect, perfect. 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 Yes. Sorry about that. Not so a problem. What I was saying, Godfrey, is that this landmark study is really going to give us some hardcore data because one of the things we've been noticing among our people is the increase in eating processed foods, cheap foods. They're cheap not only in, in terms of cost, but in terms of nutrition. And, you know, we really think that there needs to be a drastic change in our food policy and more. Um, cooperation between like the Ministry of Health, the Grenada Food and Nutrition Council, we need to really, and even the Ministry of Agriculture, we need to focus more on our local foods and eating more wholesome foods that will better nourish us and make us less vulnerable to these, the rise in the non-communicable chronic diseases that we have been experiencing so often in our country. In terms of the cost of food, I mean, obviously the food that's imported, because Grenada really is a net importer of food, but a lot of the, the costs are things that are out of the government and out of our hands, because obviously it has to do with, you know, the outside forces and things like that. But what we can do on our end is to try to emphasize and, you know, really encourage households from young to really embrace and prioritize locally grown foods that are going to be safer more nutritious and definitely keep us healthier in the long run right excellent but um Ms. mrs brown let me bring you in here um now what dr Lowe says is is i mean you know great but for example, you this afternoon, and, and I'll bring it right up. This afternoon, I, I went into a vegetable outlet, and I wanted to purchase a cabbage. And the cost of one cabbage was a little over $14, one. Um, no, no, I'm serious. Over $14. This is serious. Now... Cabbage is good, um, it's locally grown, vegetables, all of that, healthy. But the truth is, um, there are many people who are just not in a position to purchase that. Now, someone might argue, look, I can take that $14 and I can go and buy something, some processed food and maybe get a pound of rice and something else and... And what is not good for them or not best for them, but it's easier for them to access. Where I'm getting at here is whether or not um, this study can help to actually seriously change policies. Um, maybe engage the Ministry of Agriculture and see what can be done. Find a way so that you know, these foods that are best for us can be a little more affordable. Um, and, 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 and it is a long shot, I know that, but can the study help along those lines? I believe, it, I believe it can help, and I believe if the results get into the right hands, and if people are able to put the emphasis that they need to put on nutrition. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lo mentioned some key points about food being available, but the quality of the food being available. That's one thing. But the other thing is, do we have the volume of food? Are we producing the volume of food that is necessary to drive food prices down? Now, we know when we have a lot of tomatoes on the market, you can get tomatoes at $5 a pound. But there are other times that you can get tomatoes at 9 and $10 a pound. Now, for the average Joe, he's not going to take that 9 or $10 and buy some tomatoes when he can probably very well get 
something else that can share for the entire family and make them feel satisfied. Tomatoes alone is not going to do it. Vegetables are filling, but tomatoes al alone is not going to do the job. So I think um, definitely we can get that out of this study. What we can see in this study as well, and I want to revert to our, uh, uh, to go to our, um, our food-based dietary guidelines. And it's an instrument that should be utilized cross country, all, all ministries, all sectors should actually be looking at our food-based dietary guidelines. We speak about chronic non-communicable um, non -communicable diseases. The guidelines is a tool that is supposed to assist us in preventing chronic non-communicable diseases. The portion in on the guideline is showing us that we need to upsize our intakes of vegetables and fruits. This study is gonna show us which of our food groups is actually being consumed more, which is being consumed the least, and which is being consumed at a level that is insufficient. This can give us an idea as to why we're seeing some of the diseases that we're seeing, not only why we're seeing some of the diseases, but because we're going into different communities and because we're gonna to try to reach different sectors in the, within our population, we may be able to see if there are specific areas in Grenada that may be more prone to uh, nutrient deficiency or children who maybe are not uh, maximizing their potential from a cognitive standpoint because their protein intake is low because certain nutrients that did and vital nutrients the iron intake is very low we, we should be able to pull that i'm hoping that we should that we would be able to pull all of that out of this study and from that we do have on our uh, food and nutrition security policy of 2013 some revision was done last year but the document is not yet final as far as I understand, is not yet final. So hopefully this study will give us some information to be able to make some adjustments to that revision, that revised version, and so we can have a robust policy, a policy that's going to be taken on by the relevant ministries and to see that we need which education we have to focus on our children agriculture, we have to focus on our production, and I know the Ministry of Agriculture has been stepping up in terms of us seeing, being visible, and us seeing some of the things that are going on, so we know that work is being done. But something like this, an uh, 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 undertaking like this, can actually give the, the some valid information, we say evidence-based information, so that when we say we need to increase production, why we need to increase production, or we need to increase production in certain areas. Dr. Mitchell spoke about accessibility. Because a food is available, doesn't mean it's accessible. There are some, um, some communities where you can't find certain things. You would have to go out, travel out, to get those things and there's one community I know and it's a, a particular school where they would actually travel out of that parish, come down to St. George's, purchase vegetables to bring back to the school. No, this is not tongue, the tongue of St. George. This is a parish that you would probably think that there's some planting and reaping and so going on that some of those foods can go into our school. You know, so I think it's a collaborative effort, not just the ministries, not just the, um, the Food and Nutrition Council, our farmers, our communities, our community leaders. We all, this has to be, we have to, when we look at the result of this and we make it available to the public, everyone, everyone needs to be engaged and need to see how, what little role or large role they can play in us coming together to allow people to be able to afford the foods that our dietary guidelines are telling them that they should consume. Okay, wonderful indeed. Dr. Mitchell, I'm coming back to you. Let's talk a little bit about how that study will actually be conducted. Okay, thank you. Now, I wanted to mention something before I get to that. Sure. I wanted to mention the epidemiological shift. Now, the food choices that persons are making 
I would say in Grenada and other Caribbean territories, such as the, with the processed foods, that is contributing to the epidemiological shift that we are seeing. In other words, you have a transition from the communicable diseases to the non-communicable diseases. And, we, and it is quite clear and it points out clearly that an unhealthy diet is a risk factor for these non-communicable diseases that Dr. Lowe touched on. So back to the question now, how the study would be conducted. Right now, as was mentioned earlier, we are doing what is called an awareness campaign, a sensitizing campaign, helping the population to be aware that this study, why it is important, it is about to come on, and we are also underscoring that participation is encouraged, but it is voluntary. So as a result, therefore, with this study being conducted, you have, for example, the um, the, the researchers that are working with the study, but we are also going to be training those who will come out and do interviews, which would be called the enumerators. There will also be a link for the technology savvy group within the population, so it can be done online as well. So the enumerators will receive training before they come to you. These enumerators are going to be for example, college educated students or college students from TAMCC, those who attend the community college, as well as other people. Alongside that, we will have the same on mainland as well as the same in the dependencies in Kariaku and Piti Matni. So data will be collected on mainland as well as in the dependencies, Kariaku and Piti Matni. Additionally, as that data is collected, we will therefore underscore to the participants their privacy, their confidentiality will be protected and maintained. All persons who are engaged as researchers in this study underwent, which is what we would call protecting human research participant training. So that was done initially. So Everyone in the study is, has got, gone through that training. Why that is so important, as we interface with the public, they must know therefore that as researchers, we are trained to protect the human participant, those who would be participating in the study. So before they even access the study, we must obtain from them what is called informed consent. Informed consent means we give them in layman terms what the study is, is all about, how they can participate, and how the study will help Grenada. Once they consent to participate in the study, then we go forward. I must also underscore that the study will only include participants who are 18 years and older. We will not be looking at vulnerable groups, such as pregnant women, children, adolescents and prisoners they are vulnerable group we will only be looking at persons who are 18 years and over in the non-vulnerable population okay wonderful um Mrs. Brown, I want to come to you again before I go back to Dr. Lowe. Um, one of the areas you'll be looking at is the food preparation methods. Um, uh, let, let's talk a bit about that. Um, when you go out there, um, are you expecting people to sort of tell you how they prepare their meals and, and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Well, actually... Um the, on the questionnaire, there are specific questions that will um, solicit responses with regard to the methods used for preparation. And I think that uh, any Canadian, not in the home, we don't know what's happening in the home. And this is why this study is going to tell us what is happening at home. We know what is happening on the street. We know the street vending. We know the types of foods that are sold with the street vending, but we don't know if that is translating into the homes as well. So people may be very well be preparing their meals healthily at home, but when they go out, they may be eating whatever is available on the street. But we also know that um, what maybe the way people, things that people may use in terms of preparing their foods, 
can also be a contributing factor to some of the things that we're seeing. What I have to um, mention that was very surprising in the, some focus groups, and I was pleasantly surprised that when we met with vendors, we realized, well, at least what they reported is that most of the fruit flavorings, the herbs and spices and so that they use were things that were local, mm -hmm. which is something that our dietary guideline encourages. And that was, I don't know if it's the guidelines that encouraged them to do that, or if it was the COVID factor that people realized that they needed to make a shift. And they realized that based on diseases that may be affecting their own families, they were, and even themselves, they probably made that shift, which would benefit the general public who is actually purchasing the foods um, from them. But I don't know that we know what is happening right now, what is happening in the homes, and this is what we're going to be, the information that we'll be collecting, so that people can actually advise us as to what's happening in the house. So when we as the Food and Nutrition Council go out to do community um, programs, then we know what is happening in the homes and when the people come out in the community settings in the community centers to us we know exactly what kind of things what kind of programs we need to put on to influence what we got out of this study to tell us what is happening inside the homes okay wonderful so dr Lou, i'm going back to you and i, I want to talk with you again about um, the importance, and, and I'm asking you that based on your practice. You practice every day. You see adults, children, um, you name it. Now, based on what you see in your practice, um, people who come to you, um, different issues, different conditions, um, based on that, let's speak to the importance of this study. Oh, oh, the importance, as I said, the importance of this study, this is going to be a landmark crucial study because, you know, I'm hearing things from my patients. I'm trying to encourage them, but at least hearsay is one thing, but actually getting the hard data, you know, and it's going to be also analyzed correctly. And so it's really going to help to give us some real concrete information to really change the way hopefully try to influence people and change the way they shop what they purchase how they prepare their foods and that kind of thing because you know we don't really have any data recent data regarding household you know dietary intake and food preparation so that's why I, i'm really excited about this study and i think it's really going to help us as a as a country as a community to you know, get those facts and we can face the facts and see where we need to make our changes policy-wise and, and down or from down and up. You know, we just need to really come together as a country and realize that food is <laughs> is life. And if we don't secure our food and make sure everybody has access to safe and healthy, nutritious food, that crap will smoke we pipe. If some, some disaster happens, what then? Look what mm -hmm. happened with COVID. And then you had to wait online for hours. And it was just, we, you know, we just want to make sure that we're prepared and, you know, ready. Mm -hmm. who, who are some of the um, other other stakeholders in this? Um, uh, so, for example, other persons involved in the actual study? Okay, the okay. stakeholders involved, um, I will first of all, the Grenada Food and Nutrition Council, as well as the St. George's University and the University of the Southern Caribbean. So these are the stakeholders. So you will find, therefore, among the, as and in addition to that, I should say the Ministry of Health, the Grenada um, General Hospital, where the senior nutritionist is involved in the study. So I will also underscore that um, alongside with that, among the principal investigators and the co-investigators, you find all the stakeholders. So we have included everyone because this is a collaborative effort. It cannot be done, let's say, singly. Persons must come together with research expertise and skills so that the study can be conducted, the data can be collected, as well as interpreted and the preliminary reports can be prepared uh, to inform policy. 
Okay, wonderful indeed. So let's take a short break. When we come back, we continue our discussion. So with us, folks, we'll be back with you in just a moment. I am a VIP. I'm a VIP. I'm immunized. I am VIP. I am vaccinated. I am immunized. I am protected. Our children and nation depend on vaccination for immunization. Child vaccination is national priority. It is their protection from disease and sicknesses. Let's all be VIPs and safeguard our beautiful Grenada. I am DJ Blackstorm and I am a VIP health champion. Be a VIP like me. Let's all be VIP champions. A message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and Religious Affairs. Be a VIP childhood vaccination and immunization campaign in collaboration with UNICEF and the Pan American Health Organization. The Planning and Development Authority of Grenada, PDA, is enforcing regulations to curb illegal, disorderly, and unauthorized development in several locations throughout the state of Grenada. The authority is concerned that structures mainly associated with vending are negatively impacting the environment, has undesirable public health and sanitation consequences, present obstructions to vehicle and pedestrian traffic, can become projectiles during adverse weather conditions, and generally affect the aesthetics of the nation. The PDA will work along with stakeholder ministries and institutions to affect the demolition, removal, and disposal of structures which fall in the category of illegal and disorderly development, commencing January 2024. In this regard, persons who vend in or occupy such illegal structures are advised to secure their personal belongings and have the structures removed ahead of the planned PDA demolition operations. These actions of the PDA have become necessary to safeguard and protect public health and the environment, ensure the safety and well-being of all citizens and visitors, discourage any future disorderly construction, and encourage compliance to regulations pertaining to physical development in the state of Grenada. This is a message from the Planning and Development Authority of Grenada. Are you looking for a reliable, affordable, and customer-friendly pharmacy? Look no further than Hills and Valley Pharmacy, the nation's leading healthcare products and services provider. We are committed to serving you at convenient locations. Find an extensive and affordable selection of prescription and over-the-counter drugs and medical supplies at Church Street, Hillsborough, Karakou, Jubilee Street, Grenville, St. Andrew, near the bus terminal, and Halifax and Grenville Street, St. George. Our committed team is always available to offer valuable assistance for managing your health and wellness. Discover the additional benefits of for our wholesale distribution on Halifax Street and our Medgar Center on Grenville Street where we provide in-house physiotherapy, massage therapy, doctor consultations, and eye care services. Our commitment is to satisfy all your healthcare needs, including competitive prices, loyalty rewards, and special discounts for seniors. Contact us at 435-6904 and WhatsApp 535-4734. Choose Hills and Valley Pharmacy. Remember, your health is our business. Have you heard about the new Softweed bathroom tissue with Total Hygiene? As hygiene and safety have taken center stage, a bathroom tissue is now manufactured with three different technologies to offer the best protection for you and your family. UVC light technology for a safe and effective disinfection process, eliminating 99.9% .9 of microorganisms. Also, production at high temperatures, killing all types of germs and bacteria. And it's pH controlled with delicate fibers to prevent irritation for even sensitive skin. Soft Weave Total Hygiene Bathroom Tissue. Available in supermarkets and shops island-wide. Visit Soft Weave Caribbean Facebook or Instagram pages for more information. Drug abuse. Cancer. Measles, diabetes, AIDS, cancer.
Welcome back, everyone. It's Dr. and Call. For those of you just joining us, we are looking at a study that uh, will begin not too long from now. It's an evaluation on data intakes and food preparation methods pre- and post-pandemic among Grenadian households. Dr. Keisha Lowe is with us, Dr. Claudette Mitchell, and Mrs. Lydia Brown. Mrs. Brown, there is an issue I would like, and and um, all three of you can comment on it. Now, alongside the issue of um, safe, uh, available, and affordable foods, um, alongside that, the issue of wastage, will that be addressed in the study? I don't know which one wants to go first. <laughs> I don't think food wastage directly would be um, would be would come out of the study, but I think when we're able to see whether people are consuming the quantities and the types of food that they need to consume, programs can be developed to address food waste. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, we know that there's a lot of foods in Grenada, and I'm, I'm learning more and more through my product development and training officer that we have now, that there's so many foods that we do not use in Grenada. For instance, um, there's a, I guess I call it a vegetable, what we call crochonil. Mm -hmm. All right, some people call it ratchet. That a lot of the Latin American countries utilize. Now, if you go in places like in the U.S., like Texas, that has a large um, Hispanic population, you would actually see that being sold in some supermarkets. I remember buying it and then it's staying in the refrigerator and going to waste, talk about food waste, because I thought it was exciting when I saw it, but to actually prepare it, I didn't. But we were able at the council to be able to utilize that, adding our local or salt fish, right? Oh, salt fish sauce, and it was mm. very good. We actually um, have utilized things like the the red part of the banana when the banana is 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 growing, the bunch of banana. You know, there's that red yeah. flower. Mm -hmm. Utilizing that flower, something that I'm looking forward to, and our friends at Maribo is gonna. Um, the propagation station is going to assist us with that. Is looking at the um, what we call we put it in the cake. That is it the the tanker bean. I think it's the tanker bean, but mm -hmm. it comes in a big in a big um pod, and in that pod there's a flesh in there mm -hmm. that is so delicious. We don't use it. When I ask what happened to that, it just goes to waste. And this is something that people utilize. It probably can make jams. We haven't explored with it yet because we're waiting to get some. They probably can use it to make a, a drinks, beverages, maybe to you know to make different pies and different things that can people can use. That we don't use that. We use the little shell, the little nut inside, mm -hmm. and everything else is waste. <coughs> we have um, things like potato slips, um, the top of the beet plant that we cut and. And that, that's thrown away. And in other countries, that is sold. And that's the part of the beet that actually has more iron in it. So, I mean, and then we're saying that we have a lot of iron deficiency anemia among our young ones. So, I mean, this study with, is actually going to just show us what is happening. And then it's on us, the Food and Nutrition Council, who will take onus on that to see how we can show people and showcase how we can utilize this food against food waste because that is part of food security, making sure that we're not wasting food. It's one thing to have food, but there are other things that we could utilize to feed ourselves, and we're not. The breadfruit skin. How much of us, how many of us would actually utilize the breadfruit skin? We've done fries with it in an air fryer, and it's to die for. But we don't, it's not something that we think of, right? And the breadfruit we have endless of. Yeah. And it's something that we can actually just utilize. But how do we utilize it? And this is what the, the onus is on the Food and Nutrition Council to actually come up with these ideas and to showcase and show people what they can do, how they can do it, and so they can feed their families and stop throwing away for good food. 
that other countries people are consuming and feeding themselves yeah well miss brown even on top of that even you're talking about some of the exotic things but what about the regular things the custard apple mommy apple these things you just you see them a lot of the young folks don't even know them they've never tasted them and sometimes you pass in the yards and you just see the food falling on the ground Mm -hmm. So even the things that are right within our reach that are local that we traditionally used to use are not being used at all, mm -hmm. you know? And that's because a lot of our processed things are coming in and they're packaged so um, enticingly. They're so beautifully yeah. packaged that sometimes it's not even the taste. But the it's package is what is convenient, allowing... quote unquote. Yes. You know, it, I mean, you know. I tell the fruits are the original fast food. You just peel the banana. You bite into, you know, a French cashew. It's like, I, I don't understand sometimes. Yeah. But, and, but also, and then they get constipated. People's bowels are not, well, don't even get me started. People's bowels are not moving because they're not eating this insoluble fiber. It's right, not just yeah. the fiber that we can digest, but the insoluble fiber, the part that goes through to clean our intestines like a toothbrush. You know, we don't eat that. We just either spit it out or we don't eat. Like, you know, the, the whitish part of like the citrus and those things yes. are so important for us to yes. cleanse and to decrease the risk That's of colon right. cancer. And right. because when you walk around with all this stool in your system, the body actually reabsorbs some of these, these fecal mutagens. And women yes. who are constipated chronically have an increased risk of breast cancer. People don't realize that because the stool sits in their bowel. Some of it is reabsorbed. The, the best, easiest place for the body to, to store those kind of fecal mm -hmm. mutagens tissue. is fatty tissue which is breasts in women it's mainly the breasts and so women with chronic constipation actually have an increased risk of breast cancer you know mm -hmm. and it's not normal you eat in four times a day and you pass in stool every four days come on you've got to be backed up you know and mm -hmm. it's just we, we have so much work to do a lot of education but i think having the the data the hard data and the proper analysis to have validity to what we're picking up is going to help us to really improve our educational you know policies around food and also for the government and other risk um, stakeholders to really you know hopefully change how we see our food and value our food and make it a priority it's not just about buying the cheap quick thing in the supermarkets and places that won't be nutritious for us and that we can't control those those global prices really you know um, a lot of countries support their and subsidize their agricultural you know producers who people who produce agricultural products in many countries they do get a bit of a subsidy and maybe that's something we may have to look into if we if our study reveals that we need to make these things more accessible 14 dollars for cabbage is pretty high but we don't know if that's the only sale this person is going to make. We don't, you know, there's so many factors that go into how mm -hmm. you price things. And as Mrs. Brown was saying, when you have increase in production, then obviously the price is going to fall. So maybe, you know, we have to look into all the factors. It's a very complex thing. It's, I don't think there's any one answer. But hopefully this this, mm -hmm. this study will help I'll us. Bring out some right. Okay, wonderful indeed, um, Doctor Mitchell. I, I, I'm coming back to you. Um, earlier, you mentioned that um, the vulnerable population will not be included. Um, my question is, um, wouldn't they give us maybe a, a probably a better indication um, uh, as to the the whole issue of um, safety and affordability and availability of, of foods? Yes. Um, thank you for the question. You're right. We um, To include the vulnerable population, therefore, we can extend the study. This is just the first phase of the study mm -hmm. that we are doing for the Grenadian population. So we will extend the study uh, that will be the second phase to include the vulnerable population. So we want to hear from our adolescents, from children, as well as from pregnant women and also from prisoners. But I also wanted to underscore that the study focuses on diet quality, diet composition, and that is very critical. So as um, Mrs. Brown and Dr. Lowe mentioned, the various foods and how they can be utilized, we are looking in terms of the diet composition. It's the diet balance. So as we collect that data, 
we and the data is being analyzed, we would be able to see how many food groups on a daily basis that persons are incorporating into their meal plans. Okay, wonderful. Mrs. Burnham, from what I'm hearing, I, it seems as if the um, Food and Nutrition Council has a, a, a lot of work to do. We do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Uh, because some of the things you mentioned earlier, um, you mentioned cochineal. I mean, I, I know as a little boy we'd use cochineal to wash our hair. Um, I know it's good there. It, it cleans the scalp and all of that. Um, but as as a food, um, this is the first time I'm actually hearing that. So that's that, that that's news. Um, the the breadfruit skin that you mentioned. Um, usually it appears to be very starchy with the that you know that sort of sappy liquid that you know comes from it. So um, I, I've learned quite a few things that I I, I might consider trying as well you know so that that is that is good information um and 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 i think the information that is going to come out of this study would be critical um you know so that it can help guide and and i think in this case um the policies um is what is really important here because um, it will help um create changes um you know among among individuals um you mentioned there are some areas where um you you probably may expect to see some good food and it doesn't happen i can also testify of that you know there are areas when you see certain things um you wonder what is going to happen um there's a particular village i i travel on a daily basis and every day what you see children with a sweet biscuit and a pen cool and you you ask yourself um 10 15 years from now um what is going to be happening to the people in that village are we are we breeding a village of of diabetics down the line so um i think it is so so critical that such a study um is done at this point so um Definitely. I think it's going to work well. One quick question, though. Um, one of the big things that are happening now, well, not one of the big things, the big conversation in the world today is the issue of climate change. And it does affect um, our, our food security and everything because agriculture is seriously affected by climate change. Um, any consideration given to that as we go forward with that study? Well, I think um, the Ministry of when the Ministry of Agriculture when they, when they get a copy of the report, this report, and I hope not just to give a copy, but I hope to actually make a presentation mm -hmm. on the results because sometimes <laughs> we don't always read everything, so it's important to highlight some mm -hmm. of the key areas that comes out of the study so that certain things can be addressed. Now, the ministry, I think, is already on the way in identifying ways to deal with um, the climate change and the way we do agriculture. One is not just um, setting up shade houses and, and so, but getting younger people to get involved in agriculture. If we're not able to get our younger people to get into agriculture, agriculture is going to die. And that is, oh, that is how we're going to be able to, that is our sustenance. That is how we're going to be able to feed ourselves. If something like uh, COVID-19 took place and people were frantically buying because they were afraid that food was going to run out, people have to be able to be a little more secure in knowing that at least we, have, we will be able to sustain ourselves if food is not able to come into our ports we'll be able to sustain ourselves for a certain duration, right? Um, I think that um, it's important for, for us to look at how we're doing the agriculture, the mechanics that is used, the technology, how can we utilize technology? And I think I saw Tam CC just got um, a piece of equipment that it's, um, I don't know if it's like a robot, it looks kind of like a robot or something to, in, by way of agriculture. So I think we have to look to see how we can upscale our practices in agriculture. And so 
a lot is on the Food and Nutrition Council, but a lot is also on the Ministry of Agriculture, as it's on the Ministry of Health, as it's on the Ministry of Education. I heard you speak about the, the young children in the community. And so it's very important. We have a school nutrition policy that has been there since 2016 and has not been even, has been barely anything on it in terms of implementation has been very small. The Food and Nutrition Council has put on their radar for 2024 to relook that policy and to see if there are any any things that we need to change based on what is happening currently and to see how we can work along with the Ministry of Education and other key ministries to see how we can get things um, changing. Now, I went to a meeting in July, June or July, I think of 2023 in Barbados. And some of the countries have already removed everything but water and fresh fruit from the school's environment. Children mm -hmm. spend a good portion of their day in school. We may not be able to control everything that goes on in the home. But remember, when they go home, it's homework, they get something to eat, it's bedtime, pretty much. But when they're in school, is they're waking, the, the larger part of their waking hours, that's when most of what they're gonna consume is gonna happen. And if we're able to control that, then we would have had control on a great portion of what the children food intake is. If we don't look out for, I always say this, and it's like a broken record, but I always say, Yeah. and we need mm -hmm. um, shopkeepers and so, there will be nobody there for us. So we wouldn't be able because everybody's going to be sick at the same time. We're going to be old and sick, they're going to be young and sick. Right. So we're really going to have a population that's not in good shape. So we need to be able to seriously take this on and take it and everyone take it on. It's everybody's business. It's not just the Food and Nutrition Council and it's not just the Ministry of Agriculture. It is health, mm -hmm. is everyone's business. Indeed, indeed. All right, so folks, our telephone line is open. The number is 435-2041. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask um, our guests, you can do so now. The number again, 435 2041. Give us a call, and um, I'm sure uh, our guests will be more than happy to um, address whatever questions you may have. So let's go to our telephone. We have our first caller on the line. Doctor and call, good evening. Good evening, sir. How are you going? Not bad at all. Good evening. I, I think you make a very important point, Godfrey which I think the, the study should take into consideration in its initial stage. One, they should have an important study on what school children like, the type of things that school children eat, why they like those kind of things. Because to me, if you do not have an educational program in the school system, you are not building the next generation of healthy children. We have too much of trash being given to school children, and there seems to be nobody handling that um, in a manner that the school children should know what to eat, what not to eat, and there are certain things that should never be sold in a school cafeteria. And I think part of the study should be dealt with that. Another area of the study, when you're dealing with health, ladies, one of the things we cannot get away from is medicine taking. Because people might be saying, oh yes, we eat that and we, we eat that is nice, but there are people that go to doctor. And this is something I have a passionate, I, I, I want to hear people speak about the medicines. We spend millions of dollars to get the medicines from away that come in our country. Sometimes the medicine is ill-equipped. Who do we have here? Does the Bureau of Standards look to see, and I'm just drawing a reference, if the paracetamol that was sent from that company is really paracetamol and not a placebo? And all these medicines that are given our people, for instance, you might think that they have um, kidney failure, and the kidney failure could come not because of a faulty diet alone, but because of an overdose of medicine. So when you go to a doctor, the doctor hardly tell you about nutrition. Long ago, doctors maybe more. 
Um, they tell you just more about the medication taken, and some of us overdose our, ourselves with type of medication. I, I wish that at some point in time, uh, a study could be done on the type of medication we take for kidney heart disease and see how much people are still dying with it in spite of taking the medication, what is still happening with the patient. And my last point on the issue is dealing with the Food and Nutrition Council. In my opinion, they are doing a wonderful job. But at the same time, I will ask them that there is something that I have in my mind called agriculture on and health. Every hospital that is running our country and every old age home or institution should have one day in a week given only local fruits and vegetables to be eaten. If you don't want to eat it, don't go in the hospital. Any waste fruits, it should be promised that people who have any waste, whether it is swivel sweet, oranges, or anything that cannot be sold, let them give it to the Food and Nutrition Council that week. They could go into our hospitals and our homes and at least one day in the week. If you could buy it at a low price, our fruits are being wasted. And our people in hospital and things doesn't make proper use of it. The, the value of it is much better than something that you could buy in a tin. So, uh, and when people talk about our local fruits and we deal in agriculture for the sake of um, manufacturing and putting thing in tin, I sometimes just say we don't know what we have. We have some, I would have believed that we have our fruits for the benefit of our people to eat and encourage them to eat it more. Even a, a, a one day of fruit in, in school feeding program might be twisting and turning the children's mind to see the benefits of nutrition. Thank you very much, Godfrey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kola. <laughs> Okay, so, um, uh, Dr. Lowe, I, I, I don't know if you heard everything that the caller um, spoke of. So let me just, I, I made some notes. The, the first point he, he raised was um, making reference to a study being done on what school children enjoy or what, what they, they like to consume. And, and I guess he's making reference here to all the sweet stuff, like the, the, the biscuits and the, 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 the sodas and all of that. Um, so he, he's, he's asking whether or not something can be done along those lines. Um, so that was one. Um, the second one he raised um, had to do with the type of medicine that um, come in. Um, whether or not um, we know for certain uh, whether they are placebos or they are actually legitimate medication. Um, and and then the the last point he made directed to the, the Full Insurance Council, um, if we could get to a point where at least one day a week um, people, let's say, going to hospital and so should be given only fruits and vegetables. I didn't hear the last question, Godfrey. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Now, he was just saying that um, people, for example, who have a lot of fruits and vegetables, if, if it can be donated to the Food and Nutrition Council, so at least one day a week, um, people at hospitals and so can be given just fruits and vegetables one day a week. Is that at the hospital he's saying? Yeah. Is that yeah. What he's saying yeah. I, yeah. I think he made yeah. reference to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the great. first question I, um, that he mentioned, I did indicate in the discourse earlier that we would be looking at the children and adolescents in another study. So we are getting this first study completed. After this study is completed, then we would look at that vulnerable population, mm -hmm. which is very important. Okay, right. Um, uh, yes, indeed. Um, uh, Doctor Lo, I, I don't know if you want to respond to the issue of the medicine. I I, I don't know. Um, yes, I'm not sure, Godfrey, really how um, regulated the importation of drugs is in Grenada. I know for sure that the more um, you know, the controlled drugs are definitely much more regulated than the other medications that come in. You have medications from Canada, the U.S., all over Europe, even India. A lot of these companies, um, American and European companies, outsource to India, even though they're, you know, owned by American or European 
companies they're based in. labor it's cheaper for them and everything and is is about the bottom line unfortunately so it's difficult to say what um i don't think the regulation is probably as it ought to be regulated yeah like it could be you know mm -hmm. okay i understand all right um yeah well i let's go back to the telephone i think we have another caller on the line the doctor and call good evening good evening Yes, good evening. Can you can you turn the volume of your radio yes, off? It's, it's off. Okay, all right. Yes. Okay. I, I know the last caller. I, I know his his um, his ideas that he has. But let me mention one thing: <clears throat> the Food and Nutrition Council in Guinea is not doing a good job. Definitely, the Food and Nutrition Council needs to go to the community centres in throughout Grenada and Caraco and Pitimantic and educate the people on how to make use of the foods that they have, the agricultural foods, yams, potatoes, whatever. They're not doing anything. The people are on their own doing what they want with the food. They have no, they have no counsel, no, uh, no help. Hence, they are not getting their food prepared properly so they can get the full nutritional value from it. That is where the Food and Nutrition Council is is not making any impact at all. I remember Betty Finley, when she was alive, she tried to do it. Instead, she produced a booklet, uh, uh, not a booklet, but she produced a recipe book. No, that is not good enough. You need to go into the community centers and meet with the people there and try to teach them how they could prepare the food so they get added value from certain foods and whatnot. And believe me, if they don't do that, we're not going to make, the Food and Nutrition Council is not going to make one dent in what they're trying to say or do. They, they're not going to because they're not doing anything right. And this is what they do. I'm a chef, and I know Dr. Lou. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cola. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Brown, do you want to respond to that? Oh, yes, I can respond to that. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to respond because um, Grenada has many parishes, many communities. And if people don't see us in one community, it doesn't mean that we're in a, not in another community. We have done, I would be happy to send our reports and with pictures to this gentleman, if he can call me tomorrow, 4402126, so that he can see some of the work that the Food and Nutrition Council has done in communities. Just last year, we partnered with, with SAEP. We did some training with about 60, is about 68 adults across Grenada, Caracol, and Petit Martinique. We had 100 and something children that we did. We showed people how to utilize jacks to make their own sardines. Okay? We showed, I mean, there were so many things that were done during that period of time. Whether people continue to do this or not, it's a different thing. And yes, are we making the impact that we need to, to make? I would personally say no. But I also think that in doing that, you get to certain pockets in the communities about getting people to have the means to be able to continue to do these things. So it's not so much that work is not being done. Is there more work to be done? Absolutely. There's a lot more work to be done. But we're doing the work and we're in the communities and we're helping people, not only from food preparation, but remember we are the Food and Nutrition Council. So there's also a nutrition component to that council. So we try to handle both ends. And do we have a lot of work to do? I will repeat it, yes, we do. But I don't think it's fair to say that the Food and Nutrition Council is not doing anything. Okay, um, if, if, I, if I could just add a little to that. Um, I don't know if the caller follows um, this program or, or often he follows the program. But, um, you know, going to community centers and going to the community is just one aspect of it. Sharing information, I think, is also very critical. 
and Kola, the Food and Nutrient Council. I mean, they've been on this program and other programs so many times sharing information. Um, I can recall on numerous occasions, um, one of the workers there, Miss Bristol, has actually been on the program with the, 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 the portion plate, actually showing people on television how to portion their foods, what kinds of food. She also had the, what we might want to, you know, for better words, we can understand, the, the dummy foods, showing people um, what type of foods they can use and how they can use it. So, I mean, Cora, I, I, I hear you, but I would have to side with Mrs. Brown here and say that the Food and Drink Council is doing quite a lot. I mean, Mrs. Brown is always on the program. I don't ever recall calling Ms. Brown no. or the council to be on the program, and they have ever said they can't make it. Um, you know, someone is always available. Only, In fact, I think um, only recently we had um, a young man, um, I don't remember his Akeem. name. Akeem. Akeem, yes, yes. Yes, um, on the program, um, you know. So, um, Kuala, yes, the community outreach is one aspect of it, but, um, you know, when you share information with people, um, we have to also accept that as individuals, we do have a little responsibility too, you know. We have to do what we need to do. We can't just sit and say, well, you know, GFNC not doing anything. What are we doing? So um, just a little food for thought there. But so, if I might add, Godfrey, mm -hmm. please, that we also in a technological age. So I would advise people to go on our Facebook page. We have a website. There are recipes being posted every week. We have recipes utilizing our local foods that they can go online, go to GFNC, Grenada Food and Nutrition Council on Facebook, and they would see we also on Twitter where we have information, um, not Twitter, I'm talking about um, TikTok. Mm -hmm. We have TikTok, we have Instagram, so we need to get with the program. We're not going to be able to do, we're only a staff of 12 people. We're not going to be able to be everywhere every time. So we have to utilize the technology to assist us in reaching the population. All right, wonderful. Let's go back to the telephone. We have another caller on the line. Doctor and call, good evening. Yes, I'm, re I'm calling back. You know, I know we have technology, and it's a technological age. But really and truly, how many, have you done a survey to find how many people have access to the technology to go online or to go on, on Facebook and to see recipes and to understand what is going on? This is not going to work, believe me. The community we centers have, We do must have recipe reached. books available at the council that people can call and access. Just like yes. they used to do. I just had someone tell me that they call. They used to call the council and someone used to call out a recipe for them. Okay, um, when that's they fine. Call that's one a recipe. That if is you just call one the council, person, we don't have but someone to do it at that time. You we can always the um, get you a copy and you can and feel free to come and pick it up. And when we're having, you can also give me a call tomorrow and give you a number. And when we're having a community group, I will tell you where we're having it, and you'll be more than welcome to join us there, okay? Dr. Lou, I, 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 I interact with and you once. And to share it with you your friends me. and neighbors you. as well, the information. This okay. Th thank you, Kuala, for your contribution. Thanks. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay, well, we're getting close to wrap up time. Um, you know, I, I would like us to sort of summarize this discussion because I think this study is so very important. Um, and, and, and let's bring in Dr. Mitchell. She's been, Dr. Mitchell, you've been lonely for a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So, I, so let, let's uh, just go back summary, and just, yes. Uh -huh. we, would, we would like the Grenadian population to encourage their friends, their family members to participate in the study. We would also like them to remember that participation, although participation is voluntary, what they have to say and contribute to the study is very valuable in helping the, um, the collaborative work of the Grenada Food and Nutrition Council along 
with the researchers as we look forward in using that information, that research evidence, to revise food and nutrition existing programs as well as for policy formulation. So we solicit their cooperation as the enumerators come forward um, within a few weeks to get that data. Thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. Um, Dr. Lo, in closing. I just want to reiterate what Dr. Mitchell said, that this is an important study, and it's not a very long study. It doesn't take a lot of time. If you are not comfortable with them they coming to you and asking you questions, you can access the link online. And, you know, let's come together as a community and just, you know, share this information, which will be confidential, the, you know, name or anything is put on the forms or even with the link. You do not have to put your name or any identifying details about your person it's just your habits you know how often you shop what you eat how you prepare your food how many people in your household all these kind of things it's very interesting information and it's easy things that you know because it's really asking about what you how you behave around your food and prep you know preparation so i'm encouraging everyone to participate Right. Thank you. Yes, indeed. And Ms. Brung, finally, um, just to underscore the importance again of that study. I didn't get that confused. Yeah, no, I was just saying, just finally, just to underscore the importance of the study. Oh, yes. Um, I want to encourage people to do the study, to help us, to help you. If you don't give us the information, then we wouldn't know which direction we need to go. We have not had information like this for a long time. If we did before, I haven't seen it, but we haven't had it. And so if you're able to give us that information, then we can plan accordingly, and then you will see us much more in your communities because we will know which communities we need to target. Yes, indeed. Thank you so very much. Well, ladies, um, it was indeed a pleasure having you on the program. And I'm sure from time to time, Mrs. Brown, um, well, you always make information available. So I guess as we get closer, um, that information can be shared so people can be aware that the study is ongoing and, and so that uh, it is important for them to participate in this important um, study. So thank you all very much. It was a pleasure, and I look forward to having you all on the program again not too long from now. Thank you, and thanks to our viewers, thank our listeners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do have a good night. All the best. Yes. Indeed. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Yes. Cancer. Measles. Diabetes. AIDS, cancer, drug abuse, cancer, measles, diabetes, AIDS, cancer.